In today's world full of AAA game studios, multi-million dollar budget, and oceans of developers, why are some of the most enjoyable games ones that operate on an extremely thin budget and are developed by a small set of people? My thinking is these type of games are most pure to the vision of the developers, ones free from the pressures of investors, and they don't have to worry about toppling the current champion of their genre to like World of Warcraft or Fortnite for instance. These games are often full of creativity, innovation, and unconventional gameplay. Today we're looking at one of these games, Chronicon. Some of you guessed this game in my post last night, which is great work. I swear some of you guys are detectives the way you guys figured this stuff out or you just have me added on Steam, and if that's the case, I'm on to you. So a little background on Chronicon. It's being developed by Subworld. Subworld is a one-man, single-man operation based in Sweden. Development has been slow, but extremely meaningful. And when Chronicon was first devised, it was actually supposed to be a small roguelike game that would maybe last a year in development, and then Subworld would move on to something else. But the game grew large and featured a tight-knit and devoted community backing it, and Subworld put more time and effort into the game before they ultimately changed the style of play to be more of a Diablo-like experience. It's an ARPG full of loot, character progression, boss battles, and the game so far has received 50 updates in its two-year early access program on Steam, and with the new year, the developer has even more in store for its players. This is what a good game looks like. So now we know a little about the developer, we know about the journey of Chronicon so far. How does the game fare? What even is it? You know, Vulcan, why are you even talking about this game? Well, let me tell you, the story of this game has been an interesting one. The world of Chronicon no longer suffers from the threat of evil. All evil has been purged and struck down for millennia. Each year though, a handful of men and women are given the honor to relive the tales of the world's greatest heroes, tackling the grave dangers of their time. And in my playthrough so far, I'm actually reliving the story of a hero who frees a world from the madness of a corrupted priestess, driven mad by a cursed amulet. She is now hellbent on destroying all living things and purging the world. The story has been fairly engaging so far, and I'm enjoying it quite a bit. Plus, I get to see different things, which is incredibly nice. But as with all first impressions, let's start at the beginning. Let's begin at the character screen. You begin choosing a class from a small but solid selection, the Templar, Berserker, the Warden, or the Warlock. As someone who generally doesn't play a caster, typically when I do play a caster, it's in a healer capacity, I figured, you know what? Let's give the Warlock a shot. Let's see what this game is all about from a completely new perspective. No crutches, no, you know, kind of falling back on my on my archer self or my tanky self. Completely new, fresh. Once your class is chosen, you must select a difficulty. These are very reminiscent of Diablo, each one offering increasing difficulty and rewards. You guys know the trick. You start out with Recruit, Normal, Heroic, Legendary, Master, all that stuff. As you go up in difficulty, higher chance of getting Legendary drops, but the creatures obviously are harder. This game does allow you to, character, to carry your character through each difficulty, so you can continue farming uniques and Legendary loot, which I personally love this feature. It is a wonderful implementation and it allows that person to, you know, take that character they've built up, they've put a lot of time into, and then move them from difficulty to difficulty, slowly getting better. Hovering over master difficulty, or sorry, legendary difficulty, it says you need to be level 50, have a power level of 400, and, you know, keep working. So that way you can not get steamrolled the second you step foot in there. In normal difficulty, however, legendary loot does not drop unless it's a specific event. So you actually have to work your character up to heroic by boosting its item level and then switching over. Now after creation, you are thrust into the central hub of the game, the Chronicon. It's filled with vendors, trainers, portals to various timelines, and at once you are given instruction from your trainer that you must enter the first portal and eliminate the threat lurking there. With no tutorial, you jump through the portal and are immediately met with ghouls, armored skeletons that you have to dispatch. And it's really cool because they do a good way of kind of throwing you into the fire. They throw you into, you know, the, the frying pan and have you kind of flounder a bit, but learn as you go. I think I spent the first 20 minutes getting 
kind of acclimated to everything. And then after slaying a few of those ill-ridden creatures, I actually leveled up and received my first skill point, as well as a few upgrade drops, which was nice. Looking at this game, it took me a little while to kind of look through everything, right? I spent a lot of time just flipping through menus, flipping through skill trees, things like that. But let's talk about loot. Loot in this game is extremely plentiful, very much like Diablo, like Path of Exile, Grim Dawn. This genre demands fountains of loot, and Chronicon absolutely delivers. I've gotten a few uniques and fun pieces of gear from named enemies. For instance, there was a zombie called the Sleepwalker. He had extended health, he dealt frost novas, he moved slow but would deal high damage. It was a really fun fight. After he was defeated, though, he dropped a unique item. And that unique item was called the Sleeping Robes. And these gave me a passive Frost Nova that he was using and boosted my power and defense considerably. It was an exciting drop because it drops and this game has a built-in loot filter. It has a built-in loot chime, which, uh, thank you, Subworld, that's fantastic. So when a unique item drops or a legendary item drops, you hear a ding. Like, it's such a cool kind of sound. You're like, yes, ah, score, big drop. And I got it equipped and it was fantastic. Now, I think it's gonna be easy to build a spec in this game, to create builds in this game from what I'm seeing on the gear. Things like boosting companion damage, fire damage, shadow, melee, etc. And not to mention the boost to certain abilities and all your skill trees. But before I move on to your skill trees, I want to give a little a little gripe, a little, a little complaint about a small thing, and it is cosmetics. So your character doesn't change appearance no matter the gear that's equipped. My warlock has been the same green robe since I began, and while, believe me, it's a solid look for a warlock, I would like to see a little bit of progression in my appearance as I gather more of that loot. But besides that, I'm loving the loot in this game. It's engaging, it's fun, offers some really neat stuff, some creative stuff, and it drops at a pretty decent rate. I feel confident that when I fire up a play session, I'm actually going to get something that is going to be an upgrade that I'm going to, you know, need. But let's move on to skill trees. Okay, this is where things get thick. <laughs> Each class has four of these skill trees plus a mastery tree. The skill trees are various, right? They're, they offer different play styles, offer different perks. And since I'm a warlock, my trees are corruption, demonologist, Lich, and Reaper. My corruption tree is all about poisons, blood curses, summoning undead that expel rot. The demonologist prefers fire and prefers demons, as its namesake. You can summon hell pits, you can, which are little AoEs that kind of char everything to a crisp while your little imps dance around it like a campfire. A Lich uh, specializes in frost, right? They slowly decay, while the Reaper is all about anything shadow damage and all things included. Each time you level up, you gain a point that can be spent in whichever tree you like. You aren't tied down to a tree, guys. That's the amazing thing. You are not stuck to a tree, but they do have thresholds. So you can't go in and just pick whatever you want. You have to spend a certain amount of points in the tree before you can get to an ability that you're looking for. In order to get to the second row, you have to spend four points in a tree before they're available. But it's okay, you have a few abilities that are open to you that replace your spam abilities, your right-click abilities, your left-click abilities, things like that. But according to the developer, there are over 900 skills to learn and improve spanning across the entire game, which is a ton, guys, along with 600 items that have randomized attributes, various rarities, including item sets that drop. There's just a lot. So... From a skill standpoint, from a gear standpoint, we are set. This game has quite a bit in store for us, and there's a lot to go out and do, and the thing is, this stuff can drop from anything. That's the thing I like. There are obviously are uniques, like the sleeping robes, but if you can, you can kill a bat, and it could drop a unique item, or it could drop a epic item, which, that's what I love. I love that kind of roll of the dice, that... You need to make sure you take care of everything in order to have the highest chance of getting something. So at this time, guys, my warlock is rocking the corruption path. I settled on corruption, looking to kind of spread an, ec an epidemic of massive proportions. I roll through the mobs, I place dots on them that spread illness and poison to all those around them, and it has been extremely effective. It reminds me of an old school warlock, an affliction warlock from World of Warcraft. 
Now I dabbled a bit within the Reaper tree, I uh, got an AoE ability so I can have some shadow damage, make myself a little more versatile against the enemies who have resistances. And yes, certain enemies do offer resistances and straight up immunities in this game. I ran into a ton of bats that had a poison uh, resistance, which I switched over to my shadow damage and that took care of that, but that is something you kind of have to plan for. Now, I typically see the immunities on checkpoint bosses that appear along the story, and checkpoint bosses have been fun so far. I, you know, I'm not crazy about the boss fights, like they're not something that I'm going to remember for the rest of my life, but they offer challenge, you know, it's fun, it makes sense for the story, and they're fairly simple on normal, but I can see them being much more challenging on harder difficulties. So that's something that I'm really looking forward to. The dungeons themselves though, guys, the dungeons themselves are randomized and procedurally generated like most things nowadays. You know, it gives you a different experience each time you fire up a timeline or you enter that portal. One of the things that I stumbled upon though, that I really enjoyed, were the puzzles hidden amongst the chambers of the temple. Now, these puzzles were typically featuring um, different colored crystals or gems, and I had to take one, align them differently, I'd play a musical tune correctly, and each one rewarded me with a fountain of loot, and I loved it. I spent 30 minutes the other day going through and trying to figure out this puzzle, and once I did it, stood up, fist pump, so excited, sat back down, got my loot, and kept moving, and it was a good experience. Now. We know about the game's features, right? The ones that I've discovered so far, but let's actually sit down and chat about what the developer has in game that maybe I haven't seen yet. So we have full four full acts to play through. The final one is in the works right now. So we got a nice long story ahead of us, and according to the dev, there's more in store after release, so that's good. Continuing development is always a solid addition, so keep up, Subworld. There's local co-op of up to four players, one does require an Xbox controller for each additional player. Um, speaking of, the game does offer gamepad support. There's a hardcore mode. They say infinite character progression. Now, I'm not exactly sure what that means. Does it mean you keep getting things stronger and stronger? Is there no level cap? I just need some extra details around this one in particular. Now, crafting is offered, though it's called out as basic. Um, it really it offers enchanting and gymming your equipment to its maximum potential. I've seen a few of these so far, no gems, but cube sockets were on my staff. So no gems for the sockets, but I got sockets for the gems. Now, I think this is a good starting point, right? Let's say good starting point, especially for a one man game. We have quite a few things to chew on here. Subworld also lists they're working on adding more in-game content. I'm sorry, much more in-game content, uh, new mechanics, progression systems that are more fleshed out and more quote, general content, including items, quests and areas. They also released a roadmap for the new year, which includes some pretty interesting callouts on this thing, guys. We're getting a rune system, exciting, a new end game system based on difficulty leagues featuring dungeon anomalies, a new mastery system, and a complete rework of the Templar class, along with some minor tweaks and reworks of the other classes. So Chronicon is expected to launch fully in spring of 2019. So. Full release, let's go. Now, he did mention that maybe that might get pushed, we're not entirely sure, but they are targeting consoles, a console release after that full launch, but they're still working on that portion. One step at a time, I guess, so we'll have to try to figure out and see how that's gonna, gonna play out for us. Subworld plans to release DLCs, both paid and free, after launch as well. So, we have so much stuff, guys, coming with this game. We have a lot in the game already. It's a fun game. It's an exciting game. Um, like I said, I sank a ton of hours into it without even realizing it. You know, look down, 7 p.m., look down again, 2 a.m., that type of thing. So, it has been a blast. And... I'm really anxious to see what they have in 2019. They're talking about how it's going to be a big year with the release, with the post-game stuff, with the rework stuff, and as a one-man show, I'm hoping we can hit those deadlines. But, I don't know. We'll see. Overall, though, Chronicon has been a fun experience, and guys, I was so surprised. I was just very surprised to find this. I'm typically not a huge fan of, you know, the 2.5D pixel graphics type of games, but this one was fun. It was engaging. Like I said, it kept me playing for hours, has a solid loot system, a medium grade kind of build potential, and a simple 
but charming gameplay. And I can see myself spending more and more time in the world of Chronicon. My only, you know, kind of con during that entire time um, was just the more cosmetics, the appearance. I was a little disappointed um, that my characters weren't changing appearances. Even a weapon appearance change would be nice. Other than that, great work, subworld. Keep it up. Don't lose that vision. But I want to hear from you guys. What are your guys' thoughts around the gameplay, around what you saw, around kind of what you guys have heard? And honestly, guys, this game is on sale right now in early access for $7.99. And I have to say, after my first impression of the game, that is one of the best ways to spend $8. All right, folks, let's get chatting downstairs. And as always, this has been Vulcan, and I will talk to you guys next time.